The next presenters are uh, Mark Mariano and Jeremy Fliggy. Uh, Mark is with Rampart Solutions. Uh, Jeremy's with Montana Resources. And this is a group um, on waterfowl uh, at the Berkeley Pit. This is a, gr is a group I've worked with for years since it first came into being. And uh, they've, got, they've done amazing work. So Jeremy and Mark. Yeah, thank you, Dave. And um, special thanks to all of your efforts and support with the Waterfowl Advisory Board since it started um, approximately five years ago. So um, my name is Jeremy Fliggy, an environmental engineer for Montana Resources. I'm also here with co-presenter, um, Waterfowl Protection Specialist, Mark Mariano with Rampart Solutions, uh, consultant to Montana Resources. So we're gonna, first I'm gonna kick off with kind of more some background on the program, and then I'll let uh, Mark take it from there and kind of some of more of the progressive thinking that we're, we're working on, um, try to shore up, you know, as we know not everything's perfect and try to continue to learn and um, always continuous improvement. So this first slide, just wanted to first and foremost, uh, kind of a shout out to all of the various contractors, consultants and entities that are involved on a routine basis. Um, they're at the top Montana Resources and Atlantic Richfield Company, the, those that are responsible for the Butte Mine Flooding Operable Unit, which includes the, the Berkeley Pit, um, and then others that are listed there that I'll kind of uh, pepper throughout the, throughout the presentation. Uh, so first off, um, the Waterfowl Protection Program. Before I even get into the information on the slide, I first wanted to take a step back even further from there, um, back to 1995. That was uh, fall of 1995. There was a, a light geese, and for the remainder of the presentation, you'll hear light geese, and that just refers to snow geese and Ross's geese, so collectively uh, light geese. But there was a light geese mortality event that occurred, and with that, that kicked off a waterfowl protection program at the Berkeley Pit. So from 1996 to, to current, we've had an active program. Um, you know, a big item there is uh, the Montana Resources Operations Crew. They are involved every day. So it's a 365-day-a-year program. Uh, they're the boots on the ground that handle everything, day-to-day uh, -day activities. So, you know, a special, special acknowledgement to them. Um, you know, with that, we operated fairly well. Everything was uh, going pretty good and, and uh, November 2016 hit. Um, you know, at that time, unprecedented event of 60,000 or more light geese that came into the area. And within that event, um, we're on the pit, worked tire tirelessly, effortlessly to get the birds to continue on their migratory journey. Um, unfortunately, there was a pretty significant mortality event associated with that as well. Um, with that, it you know, brought to our attention, you know, another opportunity for improvement. Um, with that, the formation of the Waterfowl Advisory Board. Um, that's a board that's headed by Stella Kaposha from Montana Tech, um, as well as some updates to the Waterfowl Protection Program. So some key components of the Waterfowl Protection Program. Uh, what the new updates brought was more of an adaptive strategy. You know, we wanted to make sure to have some flexibility to continue to experiment with new novel ideas to try to understand, you know, is there something we're missing? Are there other items that we can try to include within the program, you know, make it the, the best that it could be? Um, you see there on the top right picture, we have the, the bird shack. So that's our observation headquarters. Um, as I mentioned, 365 days a year. So we do have during migration season, hourly daytime observations every four hours at nighttime, and then in a non-migration season, uh, every four hours during the daytime. So um, something that gets frequented quite often, you know, uh, special optics up there, um, you know, digiscope to be able to document things at certain instances, and then a lot of our hazing tools, which I'll get in on the next slide. Um, one of the other big changes too before was, uh, from, from previous was uh, species identification. So. Before it might have just been more of a duck, duck, goose kind of thing, and you know now we actually go through and um, speciate what what may be present on the pit. Um, you know we have a confidence interval, so it doesn't have to be perfect. But as we've realized, different species haze differently, so we wanted to take advantage of that too and be able to you know use the best tool for the for the for the appropriate species. Um, 
you know, we always had training, but we committed ourselves to, to annual training for all the staff that are involved. That way everyone, you know, stays up to date with any changes. Um, we also can fill them in on, you know, if the, how the past seasons went and try to continue to learn and, you know, really just open up that conduit so everyone's comfortable with speaking to each other, you know, making sure that we can communicate and, you know, provide the, the input back and forth and, you know, continuously make, make those adjustments to make the program as, as, as solid as it could be. Um, another big facet was these weekly reports. So, you know, in addition to, you know, the, the monitoring at the pit, we also utilize regional surveys, um, so those conducted, you know, either by uh, Go Bird Montana, Rampart Solutions, uh, Pioneer Supports at different times, as well as Montana Tech. Um, we also get reports from um, Freeze Out Lake, so that's a very key staging ground in north central Montana, and Mark will speak to that a bit more in his part of the presentation. Um, we have, during migration season, custom daily meteorological reports. So that helps us to be able to tie in, you know, how does the weather impact when, when and what we might be seeing. So, you know, when you combine all this together, it helps us to be able to have a, a status update, you know, be able to know how prepared, you know, what to expect. And that gets all culminated into a, into a weekly report. So next off with the waterfowl protection program, as I mentioned before, the speciation. So here's a poster that we have up at the shack. As you see up there, we have common spring plumage. In addition to this, so we have a similar poster in the fall as the plumages are different. So it helps to key in and help to the operations crew to best identify what species they're seeing. And they're broken up in by groups as well because most of the groups um, haze accordingly to their, to their group type as well. Um, you know, if it's not on here, we have a guidebook that further describes each of these birds that are on here as well as you know, the typical field guides that, that you can buy at the bookstore. Um, you know, next that kind of brings us into our hazing and, and deterring. Um, you know, we've explored many different things and that's kind of one of the big things that, that that 2016 event brought was us to explore what options there were out there. So, you know, some of the things that people have asked before are nets. So we have looked into nets, both physical and laser. Um, we've looked into bird balls. Um, looked into a bunch of different things, but, you know, overall, the pit is very unique, um, almost 450 acre in size. It's within the flyway of the Burt Mooney Airport. Um, also, you know, as you can imagine, Butte has very extreme temperatures, particularly on the, in the winter on the low end. So definitely face some challenges, challenges there as well as access. And as, you know, Brant mentioned as part of their um, aerial drones, and that is uh, manned access to the lake surface as well. So, you know, very unique in that situation. So some of the items that we have here on the left, you'll see propane cannon. On the right, you'll see a Phoenix whaler. So those are what they call passive deterrents. So those are items that we have just routinely going. We have numerous of them of each staged around the pit and they go, you know, anywhere from 30 seconds to four minutes um, and, you know, just continue to emit noise to try to prevent waterfowl from landing. So that would be the difference. Deterrent would be to try to keep them from landing. Hazing is getting them off the water once they have landed. These next two would be more of our day-to-day -day bread and butter. Uh, the one on the left, uh, rifle, long-range rifle. The splashes near the waterfowl, very effective at getting them to move. Um, even more effective in the fall when they've faced hunting pressure and you can continue to keep them going on their migratory path. On the right, you'll see a green laser beam. So that's from a handheld laser. Um, we have special approval through FAA, as I mentioned, as we are in the Burt Mooney flight path. Um, very effective. Obviously, the limitation there is low light conditions. So we've got to make sure to be able to util utilize that in those type of situations. Um, but like I said, those are kind of the everyday type tools that we use. The next, um, before I flip to it, I wanna just uh, make mention of, of a journalist. Her description of it was unapologetically apocalyptic. So as you see here, this is a very large cannon, so much bigger than the propane cannon there. This one's fired using oxygen and acetylene. And as you heard from Mark Thompson yesterday, uh, Montana Resources has a pretty astounding safety record. 
As you might imagine from seeing this picture and hearing that description, um, you know, after trials and trying to see if it could be a fit, it didn't meet the safety culture with, with Montana resources, so it's since been removed from, from service here. Um, as Brant showed, here's some items that, that uh, Atlantic Richfield contractors, um, so Fairweather IT developed the aerial drone and the drone boat seen here, um, operated either by Fairweather IT or by Pioneer Technical Services. So we have the aerial drone on the left and then the drone boat on the right. So depending on um, conditions, there are additional tools that we can add to the mix. And then you'll see in the lower left on the aerial drone photo, you'll see a searchlight. So that's for our nighttime observations. Um, kind of another funny thing there is that we, you know, had to go to a marine vendor for that. So main applications, obviously boats, ships. Um, when we were asking them, they were asking us, well, what are you using it for? They said, well, the only other other than marine was was prisons. And then now we can add Berkeley Pit to the mix too. So, you know, pretty specialized um, searchlight, but obviously it helps us to facilitate our requirement and the ability to be able to do nighttime observations as well. Um, one picture that isn't on here, uh, you may have noticed in Brant's presentation he had where he was taking off from the Birdshack area or their home base for their aerial drone. There was a trailer there and we have two custom built firework trailers. So ability to either lob shots into the pit or to try to kind of create a, a wall of with, with those fireworks and the intent there, you know, is to, to try to defend ourselves if we do um, know of some, some waterfowl that are incoming. So this next one kind of gives a little bit of a history from the program 1996 through uh, 2020. Um, I didn't include 2021 as that'll be a little further detailed on the next slide. Um, and in addition, you'll see the disclaimer at the bottom where this does not include the November 2016 event. So you'll see here 2020 was our largest year on this graph with right around 15,000 waterfowl that made it to the pit. Um, 2021, right there in the in the same realm, right around 15,000. And if we included that, that event was as many as 60,000 or more, we would have you know blown off the chart. So wasn't included for the purposes of this. And you know we did kind of treat it as a bit of an anomalous event. However, we're not satisfied. We want to continue to make sure that we can you know better understand and and hopefully be better prepared for such event if it were to occur in the future. So. Over this time span, 1996 and actually to current, uh, the success rate at the pit is 99.8% of getting waterfowl to continue on that migratory journey. If you do include in the 2016 event, we're still uh, north of 98% as far as the success. Um, as I mentioned then, the next slide, this shows more of a breakdown. So we have our spring migration season totals. So this is May, March 1st to May 31st. We have fall right below it, which is August 15th through the end of November, with flexibility to extend any of the seasons depending on uh, what we're seeing and you know if there's lagging season with the with the migratory path with the migratory journeys, and then we have non-migration. So even when we're into you know outside of those seasons, we still have our observation frequency of every four hours during the daytime. If we see activity. We, we escalate as necessary. So you'll see here this annual total, 3,347. That's individual pit observations that were made in 2021 with 15,000, just over 15,000 waterfowl observed. And then, as I mentioned before, the 99.8% success. So one common theme, you know, when I mentioned kind of the commencement of the program, 1995, and then 2016, was light geese. Um, you know, that's obviously not all that we're worried about, but as you can see, we've shown and proven pretty good success with, with all of the other waterfowl, but that's one item that we're looking to continue to shore up. So with that, that's where I'll pass it over to Mark Mariano, and he's gonna provide a little more on kind of what we're looking at moving forward to try to better predict and be prepared for, um, you know, the, the light geese movement that we could continue to see. Thank you, Jeremy. 
For my part of this presentation, I'm going to discuss how we continue to integrate and implement both classic and modern advancements in waterfall biology into the program. But first, a light goose biology lesson. Um, there are three reasons, three main reasons, likeys continue to, pro to, to provide a vulnerability to the success of the program. And the first is that they migrate extremely long distances when compared with other waterfowl species. Um, the second is that they tend to migrate in huge flocks. So a lot of them move at once. And then the third is that unlike your backyard birds or some other waterfowl species, they tend or they are conditional migrators, meaning that the conditions around them govern when they're going to make a migratory jump and not so much the calendar date. These conditions can be summed up in what we've deemed the migration triangle here. So like geese primarily feed in agricultural fields, so their access to food is limited when there's too much snow on it. They roost at night on water bodies adjacent to these fields and when those water bodies begin to freeze they lose that access to the roost and they must move and then third there are specific weather conditions in the areas in which they stage and i'll get into that in a minute that seem to be major drivers for migration so understanding this migration triangle and implementing some of this telemetry data which i'll speak to in a minute allows us and has allowed us over the past few years to make really accurate forecasts on when to expect large migration events, otherwise known as grand passages. The other reason that they pose such a threat is that there's just so darn many of them. Um, every year, multiple agencies from the United States and Canada and conservation groups perform a continental-wide waterfowl survey called the Breeding and Population Survey. The last time this was performed was in 2019, and that was due to COVID. But however, in 2019, there was an estimated 1,856,000 light geese in the Pacific Flyway alone, 15 million across the continent, and growing exponentially. So into this telemetry, the probably the largest advancement in waterfowl biology and ecology in the last 10 years has been the implementation of GPS tracking collars. So these are small collars, I'll show you a picture in a minute, that are attached to individual birds that utilize the cell tower network to, to bring in data over time intervals. In, in this picture here, you can see each one of these dots represents about 15 minute bing in uh, uh, over that time interval. And then at each time, it sends a variety of data. Um, everything from elevation, bearing, bar barometric pressure, and then the ones we really care about are, are speed. So in this case, this was one snow goose that left a staging area, so they do not fly their 2,000 plus mile journey in one jump, they'll make multiple jumps. In between each jump, um, they'll rest for a while and refuel on food and get ready to make the next the next big one over areas with less good habitat, if you will. So this was spring 2017. This was one snow goose that was going north from a Boise staging area. You can see its location. It bypassed the Butte area to the north. Um, the time it took for it to go from Boise to Freeze Out Lake was about nine hours that's important because if we make a forecast we need to know how long we have to be completely prepared for it um, the average speed again was 40 miles an hour a max speed for a snow goose is about 50 miles an hour and that plays into physics and energetics where a snow goose whose speed is 40 miles an hour is likely not going to fly into a headwind that's 60 miles an hour because it just that's just not going to work out um, where it would likely benefit from a tailwind of, of such speeds. Um, and then distances. In this case, it was the spring. That 350 is about the average spring jump, whereas in the fall, it can be much larger, posing a greater threat to the program. Here's what one of those collars looks like on a snow goose. On smaller waterfowl, they can be attached to their backs. Um, if you didn't know what you were looking at or really paying close attention, you might not even notice one was on if you were looking at a bunch of them. They're solar powered. And then the raw 
results of having this looks something similar to this. Um, so this is 18 different species and only the Pacific Flyway with some that have jumped into the Central Flyway, which is a big uh, discovery with this GPS telemetry. We don't care about those ones that leave the flyway. Uh, and you can see Butte there in the red star. And we'll look at more specific telemetry data here. So we wanted to focus on our specific migration corridor. And we had assumed for years, based on the legal flyway, that we were just on the east end of it. And then every so often, something funky happened that pushed them east or whatever. And it turns out, when you've got tracking collars on them, we're right dead in the middle of this thing. So the black dots are those intervals. This is only light geese. And um, and then the green, what we did is we took the densest part of it. And you can see we're in that. And I refer to that as the Milky Way. What they do is they'll winter in the Central Valley of Southern California. They'll, in the, in the spring, they'll go, we'll go spring first. They'll make a small jump to the Boise, Nampa, Camas Prairie area, get ready, and then make a big jump over the Rocky Mountains. There's no habitat there. They're essentially going from flat agricultural areas to flat agricultural areas. And lucky for us, although we're in the middle of that corridor, we're essentially underneath the jump. They'll move on to up here, which is the major staging area. This is used in both the spring and the fall. We focus on it in the fall because it's directly north of us, and it's the last place they'll stop before they make that jump over the Rockies back down towards their wintering area. And then, of course, from here, they'll jump over the boreal forest and into the Arctic to breed in the summertime. To make forecasts based on this telemetry data and our migration triangle, we had to define the staging area first so we know specifically where to look at those weather variables. To do so, we took the telemetry data off movebank.org in three different layers. This, is a, this represents animal density, line density, and just the dots themselves. And you can see we were able to quite easily draw this line around this area. We did this only with telemetry data and not satellite data, so so we were really hoping that it would overlap with habitat, right? And when we put it over satellite imagery, it did exactly that. So what you can see is if and it would be nicer if we could zoom in in um, ArcMap or, or whatever, but inside there is ag fields littered with small water bodies. It's prime areas for snow geese to get ready for their next big move. Outside of it, to the east, you've got more dryland prairies, so you're lacking the water. To the north is the is is forested, and to the west, you've got the Canadian Rockies and the foothills. This next slide's a little bit complicated. What you can see here, though, this was that green shape with the hole punched out of the center. The large black circle on the outside is a 600 mile radius around Butte. Now, this is a theoretical because Butte isn't generally a staging area. So um, that's the long end of a jump. The red circle is about the average. That's 350 miles away from Butte. And then in the inside, we created that. That's about 200 miles to be conservative. So if we see light geese around in that area in large numbers, the chance that they would actually end up in the Butte area are extremely low. What was interesting about this is when we overlaid, this is that fall staging area that we defined in the fall, that lines up just about perfectly on that average migratory jump. So you can see why we have bigger issues in the fall than say the spring. This is the Boise Nampa staging area, which is just about inside that kind of safe zone. For the last leg of that migratory triangle and really understanding what drives these this large scale migrations, we started to notice that it wasn't so much specific storms or events like that, um, but that it was continental scale wind patterns. Um, on this map here, you can see a large low pressure system to the east of Montana, a high pressure system to the west of Montana. This again is just a rough outline of that major staging area. So the way that these pressure systems spin relative low pressures counterclockwise, high pressure clockwise, it set up just a perfect wind corridor right over the staging area. And if you're a snow goose and you've got to hedge your bet, 
and you only know what's going on around you and you're about to jump over the Rocky Mountains, you're probably going to pick the day where you've got a tailwind. It's, you know, it's, it just has to do with, with the energetics factor. So in fact, we used these our resources to forecast this migration event five days ahead of time. And we were all patting ourselves on the back when we got calls from around the state warning us of large flocks of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of light keys passing over Southwest Montana. So as of now, we're doing this in analog and we've been able to do that for the past couple of years. However, we'd like to back it up mathematically and statistically, which, we're, which is our next step. And we're working with scientists from across the country and, and an amazing grad student. We've got Dr. Steve, Steve Hayes from Gonzaga University. It's a stats heavy project, so we really needed a specialist there. Bailey Tasker, a native and a graduate student at Montana Tech, also doing her best to, on her own time to keep waterfall out of the Berkeley pit. Um, Dr. Schumer, who literally wrote the book on waterfall migration forecasting out of State University of New York, asked us to be on the project, which was cool as could possibly be. And Dr. Stella Kaposha from Montana Tech, who's also the chair of our Waterfall Advisory Board. And that's that. So I guess I'm just sort of curious, are there certain, I guess, um, tolerances or variances that are allowed in the number of fake of light bees because of that, or is it treated like all other water bottles? Well, I think we're in a pretty unique situation where we are under a uh, consent decree. So, and also with the Migratory Bird Treaty Act where they're um, cannot be an intentional taking. Um, so, you know, really our, our goal is to minimize impact to the waterfowl and keep them continuing on their migratory path. But, you know, we're held to, you know, the waterfowl protection plan that's in place and that's approved and to continue to implement that. Yep. And then additionally, the conservation order doesn't apply to the Pacific Flyway. Um, so this year was the first year Montana joined the conservation order and only eastern parts of Montana got to partake in that. Well, who knew when Arco pulled the pumps in Butte and the pit began to flood, fast forward to a room full of people at a mining conference listening to detailed studies of uh, <laughs> bird behavior. Who, who knew that the one would lead to the other? Thank you for your yeah. work and your presentation. I noticed uh, in, in, your, in one of your early diagrams, you showed a great upward leap in the number of bird visits to the pit, I think in, in 2020. Do you have uh, an explanation for that? So I think throughout the various years, I think we've seen definitely some variability. Um, you know, one item that could come into play is following 2016, um, improved optics, um, improved counting methodology. However, you know, I think there could be just some natural variability as well. I mean, you know, whether it be water years, different things like that, where, you know, could this mega drought come into play in the future to see a decline in numbers as well. But right now, um, you know, I think we're just continue to collect data and see how those trends continue. You think it might be partly related to the fact that the water in the pit now looks more like water? It isn't, it isn't brownish purple anymore? Yeah, no, I do think there could be a lot to do with that as well. It's much more inviting um, until they get there. <laughs> Other questions? Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks.